Philippe Lemoyne. Is it Philippe Lemoyne? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, Philippe Lemoyne, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll let you pronounce yeah, well, it. I've never met an American who pronounced it right anyway, so I've stopped correcting people. <laughs> All right, uh, Philippe, uh, you are a PhD student in philosophy at Cornell University. You hold a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Bordeaux in France and a master's degree from uh, Sciences Po Bordeaux in international relations. Um, and you have written a very interesting piece, which I saw in the National Review, uh, calling to the attention of your readers the um, uh, the uh, inadequacy of the narrative which portrays violence against black men by police as being so widespread uh, that uh, people like myself need to fear when we encounter policemen on the streets at a traffic stop or whatever. You believe that to be incorrect. And more broadly, you as an openly conservative person on America, an American campus have been thinking and writing about the problems of uh, effective deliberation and discourse over complex issues of uh, public policy um, in uh, the environment that has come to exist on American campuses. So I wanted to talk to you about all of that and uh, welcome you to The Glenn Show. Thanks a lot for giving me some time. Thanks for having me. You are uh, home in Bordeaux at the moment. Uh, I'm actually in uh, another region. I'm uh, I'm at my parents' place right now in the Sarthe, which Aha. is a region to the slightly southwest of Paris. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we could start by you uh, telling us a little bit about how a, a Frenchman uh, and a philosopher. Uh, are you studying uh, uh, epistemology? Is that your uh, area uh, of concentration? I do, uh, yeah, epistemology of science and logic. Aha. So it's what I do. For my work, you know, my research is very remote from, you know, this stuff that I talked about in the, in the the article. I just, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm very interested in policy issues in general, and so I, I got into this. Maybe I can tell you how, but. Uh, well, yeah, I'm interested in knowing how you became in, involved in these uh, uh, debates, these contentious debates in the United States about politics and culture. Uh, being, if you will, a, uh, a foreigner uh, to our uh, to our society and so on. I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I wasn't at first. You know, I arrived in the U.S. in 2010. That's that's when I started. And um, uh, you know, first few years, I was still very much plugged into the the French politics only. You know, and I didn't care that much about the the U.S. But uh, you know, as you stay more in a country, you get interested in what's going on around you. So that's what happened to me. And and if we're talking in particular about the issue of police violence against blacks, uh, uh, and, you know, the, more generally the uh, uh, problems that uh, black people face in the U.S., that's, uh, that's not something I got really interested in until after the um, Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson. So I think that was in 2014, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and I guess what prompted me to, to look into this stuff more closely is that, so by this point, I had already been in the U.S. for a few years. And, and like I told you, I hadn't really looked into this at all before. So, I mean, I, I didn't know anything. Um, but I was listening to my friend, and obviously because, you know, I'm on a campus, like most of my friends are liberals. Uh, and I was listening to them, and I don't know, it just felt weird because I felt like I was... I was hearing people describe a situation that just that look a lot about like what I have read the U.S. were like 60 years ago, but you know, it, you know, it just sounded some of the stuff they were saying just sounded implausible, or at least implausible that it was taking place right now, uh, because you know they were they were describing a situation where um, like open racism at a place that. Uh, you know, that seemed at odds with what I could observe in my daily life. So I was like, oh, that's weird. So um, I started reading quite a lot, actually, at this point, you know, and like going through the data. That Because one thing that's great in the U.S. compared to France is that you have lots of data that are publicly available. Yeah. So anyone, any guy like me, you know, I'm just a, a philosophy student, I, I can go through this, you know, and even though I'm, I'm not a sociologist or whatever, but I can, so you, yeah. you know, you have access to a lot of stuff. And I started going through them and, you know, reading uh, the literature because, you know, as you know, there's an extensive literature on a lot of these issues. 
And and what I found out is that, at least according to me, the, the, the dominant narrative in the media, which is the one that my friends were, you know, uh, propagating, uh, was, I think, uh, very inaccurate. You know, I mean, at least they were making claims that weren't really supported by the evidence. And and they were making claims that, that made, uh, you know, one, one thing that bothers me with this is that uh, when I read or hear a lot of this stuff, uh, it kind of trivializes uh, the, the great progresses that have been made, uh, like during the civil rights era, etc. I, I felt like we were still... You know, they, they want to say, you know, it's like this uh, Michelle Alexander book. Um, uh, the, the, new, the New Jim the, Crow, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, they want to say that those changes, which I think were tremendous changes for the better, uh, are only very superficial. And that deep down the U.S. is still, you know, a white supremacy uh, and, you know, you have all, you know, there's like a cottage industry of articles about the, the power of whiteness uh, and all this stuff, you know, and that really present the situation as if it hadn't changed fundamentally. They want to say that those are just superficial changes, but that uh, if you uh, go a little deeper, if you leave the, the surface of things, you will find that uh, really uh, it's still a white supremacy, it just took a very different form. Correct. But, but deep down, you know, it's basically the same thing. And I'm like, no, I mean, I don't think that's right. You know, that's, it's not right. And uh, I don't think it's a good idea that people think that because it's false. And also because it, you know, it doesn't help anyone to, to think something like that. Oh, okay. So I've got two questions for you. One is, why is it wrong? I mean, it's not just Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow, the best-selling book that uh, lays the... Um, the tragedy of the mass incarceration of African American men uh, at the feet of uh, racist police and a racist war on drugs. It's not only that. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, the writer at The Atlantic, is now an uh, uh, international celebrity. His uh, book won the National Book Award. His uh, uh, magazine writing has earned him a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, etc. I heard Jeffrey Goldberg, the editor uh, of The Atlantic, uh, defending Coates at a lecture, public lecture here at Brown recently, and he's all in with ta Coates and that narrative. It's not only that, it's political figures, it's journalists at uh, major organs, um, uh, and so on. So uh, uh, the other question I have, I want to know why you think it's wrong, and I also want to know what your thoughts are about why this false narrative, is, on your understanding, is so widespread. Okay. Uh, so why I think it's wrong? Well, you know, because when I look at the evidence, I don't think it's supported. So, for instance, if you take Michelle Alexander, Alexander's book, she claims that um, the war on drugs uh, was just a way of... Well, you know, she claims for that the war on drugs is the main culprit in the uh, 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 extraordinary rate at which uh, uh, black Americans are incarcerated. Right. Uh, and she thinks that this is just a new form of social control that the white majority imposes on, on the black minority. No, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm very skeptical. In fact, that's, I'm more than skeptical about the uh, opportunity of the war on drugs. I think there are lots of good things to be said against the war on drugs and that. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I think, in fact, that a lot of it is nonsense and that this is very misguided. But when I look at the data about incarceration, you know, it's just not true that the majority of black men in prison are in prison because of drug crimes. You know, it's just not true. Um, and, you know, even when they are in prison for drug crimes, uh, often, uh, you know, there was a plea bargain. So it wasn't for, purely for a drug related right. crime. But, so, you know, so, so, you know, the. Like the basic facts contradict the, the narrative, and you're right. It's not just Michelle Alexander. I mean, of course, you cited Tanya Hissi Coates. That's that's the. Uh, I mean, he's all the rage right now. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't know. I, I I think I don't think he makes any sense. You know, he, like he, he seems to attribute the power to race and racism. Uh, that again, I just don't think is warranted by the evidence. You know. Uh, and I'm not saying that there is no such thing as racial bias. I mean, of course, there is such a thing as racial bias, and it has uh, some influence on um, 
on various uh, outcomes that, that you can observe in American society. But if you take incarceration, for instance, uh, on my blog I did I wrote this post where uh, I, I used like a very simplistic model to try to estimate, and I used a uh, recent meta-analysis uh, from the literature about um, bias at several stages in the criminal justice system, so bias in arrest, right. uh, sentencing, et cetera, et cetera, right. to try and estimate what parts of the black-white gap in incarceration rates could be attributed to, to race, to, to, to race, racial bias. Right. And what I, so, you know, with all the caveats in the world, you know, it's a very simplistic model, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. but even making crazy hypotheses, I find that at best or at worst, rather, uh, it can explain about 20% of the gap. So really what I think that the evidence warrants is that um, most of the, the vast majority of the difference between the incarceration rates of uh, black people and white people in the U.S., is due to difference, differences in behavior. It just happens to be the case that black people often at much higher rates, especially with violent crime than white people, and that's why they more often end up in prison. No, there is also bias that contributes to this. But my point is that it's a relatively small part compared to those differences in behavior. So what I want to say, what I try to, the point I'm trying to make to when I'm talking to my liberal friends is look, I'm not saying there is no such thing as racial injustice, okay? I'm saying you're uh, incorrectly identifying the, the, the causes of this injustice. You're saying it's bias in the criminal justice system that explains why uh, blacks are uh, over-incarcerated. And, and I think it's not warranted by the evidence, although, again, there is bias in the criminal justice system, and it explains a little bit of this. But I think... Uh, rather, what explains it, the proximate cause, is that, again, black people often at much higher rates. No, that's just the proximate cause, you know. There are reasons for this. I mean, when you, you know, there, there is, I don't want to caricature, because, you know, we tend to forget also that, like, most black Americans are doing just fine, you know. Like, that there, you know, there is a large now uh, black middle class, that, you know, and uh, they're not, like, not every black American is living in a ghetto, but there are a lot of uh, American blacks who are living in, uh, in, in terrible uh, circumstances. So imagine you grew up in um, imagine you grew up in a uh, uh, in a black ghetto where 60 percent of the population is below the federal poverty level. 80 percent of kids live in a, a, a single uh, family, single sing, a female-headed family uh, where people are selling drugs on every corner, etc. Well. Of course, they often more yeah. than, than yeah. white people. I mean, you know, it's just, and that's the thing that I find really weird is that if you're a liberal, you shouldn't be surprised by it because they're the first to say, to insist on, and they're right about that, to insist on the importance of one's circumstances on, on one's life, you know, depending on where you're raised, how you grew up, etc. It's going to influence uh, what you do. I, I don't mean to say that you have no responsibility, you know, you know, you you're still making choices, etc. But it's just a fact. That's so that's the one thing. I, that's the thing where I think conservatives are wrong. Is that they say, well, in the end, it's always a matter of choice, and they're right about that. But once you've said that, you haven't solved the problem because it's still gonna. It's still the case that if you're raised in certain circumstances, like in the kind of environment I was describing, as a matter of statistical fact, you're more likely to make the bad choice. And and so. Uh, so, you know, saying it's choice, you know, it's personal responsibility, okay, you know, you can say that, it's not going to solve the problem. But what I find really weird is that um, liberals who insist on these things, you know, they are the ones who correctly, to my uh, mind, uh, insist on the importance on one's circumstances, on, on the way in which uh, one leads his life, one's life. Uh, yet they want to insist that despite all those, you know, despite the terrible circumstances in which a lot of uh, uh, black Americans live, they want to put, you know, this is a pretty obvious explanation for incarceration rates, but no, they want to put the blame on racial bias in the criminal justice system. And again, I'm not saying it plays no role, but, you know, even before you start looking at the data, common sense should tell you that this is a more plausible explanation for the bulk of, of the gap. And then, you know, I think that when you actually look at the data, that's, you know, that's confirmed, you know. So, 
that's that's basically my take on this. Um, yeah, it happens to be pretty much my take as well. Um, I I actually gave some lectures at Stanford. It's almost ten years ago now on race and incarceration, and I make this point about individual responsibility and social responsibility. The criminal offender is responsible for his actions. We, and as a society, have no choice but to hold him or her responsible for the actions taken. But it's not as if that's the only issue of responsibility at play. The actions taken, well, may be choices, but they're choices compelling to the individual who takes them only because of the circumstances in which that person finds themselves. And those are circumstances over which we collectively have a great deal of discretion. So there's enough responsibility to go around. But I'd, I'd like, I, I'm interested, I, I asked you, um, you know, why do you uh, reject uh, this narrative? You say, because it's inconsistent with the facts. I ask you, well, why do you think people persist in a narrative that is not uh, empirically supported? Uh, and you've uh, you've alluded uh, in some ways to your thinking on that, but I want to I want to just press that a little bit further because I have a hypothesis. Um, here we are in the year 2017. It's a half century past the um, civil rights movement, and you're right, I think, to extol the virtue of what has been accomplished in transforming American political uh, institutions, as has occurred in this uh, period since the middle of the 20th century. So here we are. And yet, the prisons overflow with young black men. And yet, the gap in SAT test scores of high school graduates seeking admission to places like Cornell University or Brown is as large as it is. Um, there are so many, the two-thirds to three-quarters of the youngsters born to African-American women grow up in households where the father is not present, at least not consistently so. Uh, we can tick off all these statistics of uh, disparity and uh, my sense is that uh, the advocates of the interest of African Americans, who are almost to a person uh, liberals, uh, Democrats at the left of the American political spectrum, um, are intellectually exhausted. They don't know quite what to say by way of remedy. Um, and the uh, attraction of the narrative, white supremacy, the permanence of it, uh, racism has just gone underground. Of course, if you ask people their opinions, they're going to tell you they're not against interracial marriage. But deep down, institutional racism, tacit racism, there are so many uh, social psychologists have got a, a thousand yeah, different ways of, uh, of finding bias, implicit <laughs> bias and so on. Um, that narrative is just a um, psychologically irresistible uh, way of avoiding the reality of we're in a pickle. We're in a very tough place. There's no obvious way out of it. Um, and uh, we don't want the responsibility for it to be placed at the feet of, quote, the black community or of the victims. We don't want to blame the victims. Uh, and uh, moreover, moreover, and this is key, liberal whites respond to uh, the accusation of racism with guilt, uh, with, uh, with a certain kind of uh, acceptance. Ta-Nehisi Coates is as uh, successful as he is in large part because the narrative that he's putting out is being uh, uh, accepted and embraced not only by black people, not even mainly by black yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my, my hypothesis is that this is a kind of breakdown of the liberal political intellectual um, edifice in the face of an intractable problem to which people have no answers. Yeah, and, and you know, on, on that point, I, I, so this is interesting. On that point, I think that the fact that I'm, fr I, that I'm French uh, gives me like a perspective I may not have if I weren't, if I were American, which God forbid. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. We would love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason is that, so that's one of the things that surprises me the most is one thing you alluded to, or you, you did more than allude, allude to it uh, just now, is... Uh, Really, like American whites just love to feel guilty. I mean, it's it's something that's really, really, you know. And and the stuff with Tan Tan <coughs> I think you're right. I think that's a, that's one of the main uh, reasons for his success, especially with with white people. I, 
honestly, sometimes I read stuff on Facebook and I think like it's pathological. I mean, <coughs> uh, I, again, you know, I, I, I do actually think that, uh, agree with you what you said before, that it's not as if the rest of society had, had no responsibility. It's not as if, um, even though we ended uh, Jim Crow and and, uh, and all that like more than half a century ago, it's not as if this stuff didn't have still consequences. You know, one of my pet issues is housing segregation. I think this is a thing where addressing that could actually do a lot of good. I'm not saying it's a miracle solution or whatever, yeah. you know, that it's going to solve all problems. But I do think if you're looking at something that, you know, uh, in, a, in my most recent post on my blog, I cite the study... Um, uh, about uh, the effect of housing segregation on the uh, black-white uh, standardized test score gap. And the study in question finds that uh, it explains about 25% uh, of it. Now, you know that, trust me, that's a lot more than you're going to get by looking at bias, you know. And so, okay, you know, I think this is something where uh, putting, you know, using your political capital and putting money to try to address housing segregation, I think this is something that could actually, again, I'm not saying it's going to solve all problems or anything, but I think you could see substantial gains but by doing that. But uh, instead, you know, it seems as though, um, you know, when I say that to, when I say that to my liberal, almost all of whom are white friends in the U.S., they're, they're okay with this. They're like, oh yeah, great, let's, let's, let's do this. But then, you know, uh, they're not going to spend like 1% of the time they spend uh, uh, whining about racial bias talking about this, you know, and, and, you know, and I think that there is a, you know, it's difficult to figure out exactly why, but so you, you put your finger on one of the reasons there is this guilt thing, you know, that they just love their guilt trip. Uh, and, and I think, I think these days, especially, you know, since Ferguson, etc., there is also a lot of virtue signaling going on where, yeah. uh, you know, people just, and you know, if, if you virtue signal about segregation, it's not as cool as virtue signaling about, you know, racial bias from the police or that kind of stuff. So let, let me ask um, you something now. Are you familiar with Elizabeth Anderson's uh, book, The Imperative of Integration? Yeah, I haven't read it yet, but that's one thing on, that's been on my list for a while. So this is a philosopher at the University of Michigan, I'd just tell the audience. Uh, she is herself a woman of the left, I think she would say. Uh, but uh, And, I should say, she has written this book now several years ago, published, uh, which makes a sustained philosophical argument on behalf of the position that we won't get past this problem of racial inequality until we can affect uh, in a broader based way than has been achieved so far, the integration of the races in institutions, but also more broadly in social life. Uh, but, but Tommy Shelby, uh, the philosopher at Harvard, uh, whose uh, recent book, uh, Dark Ghetto, uh, sets out a Rawlsian uh, influenced uh, sort of comprehensive philosophical approach to the problems of persistent racial inequality. Uh, takes strong issue with Elizabeth Anderson. I simply want to bring this to your attention, uh, uh -huh. arguing against the uh, the necessity of achieving residential racial integration. He wants the integrity of black communities to be protected and feels that there is a kind of, uh, and I hope I don't do him a disservice in my brief summary of his argument, a kind of uh, uh, denial of the of the dignity and of the worth of African Americans built into the very idea that they have to be combined with whites in order to be able to have an equality of, uh, of status and opportunity in the society. So there's an argument. I simply wanted to put it on the table yeah, about integration. Yeah, well, like, if I may respond to this, here's what I would say to this. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, um, look, I think the right way to look at, or at least perhaps to, to answer this, is to point out that uh, there is a sense in which it's only accidentally a racial issue here. Because the reason why I think that housing segregation is such a, is such a big problem is that I think there is such a thing as neighborhood effects. Where, uh, So, you know, take the case of poverty. It's not just the case that black people in the U.S. are much more likely, about three times more likely than white people to live under the federal poverty level. Uh, it's also the case that when they're poor, they're much more likely than, than poor white people to be surrounded by other 
poor people. Yeah. Now, if you, you know, and that, I think that makes a huge difference because there are lots of studies that, you know, uh, one thing that always depresses parents when they learn it is that people vastly overestimate the importance of parenting. Uh, it's not that it's not important, but it seems that peers, uh, kids' peers, are even more important. So it's really very different if you're, uh, you know, I mean, if you have a school that's uh, where 80% uh, of the kids uh, come from a uh, 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 single parent family, 60% uh, live under the federal poverty level, et cetera, et cetera, you can put all as much money as you want. You can put the best professors you want. You're not gonna, you're not gonna lift a lot of them out of uh, poverty. You know, it's 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 impossible. I mean, and it doesn't really matter if they're whites or blacks. You know, if you had this similar concentrations of poverty with white people, you you know, you those would be in a lot of trouble too. You know, and in fact, you know, there. Um, it's interesting when you look in uh, in the UK where you have a, a white underclass that has very similar problems to the the black underclass in the U.S. Well, you know, they're white, but they they also, uh, in many ways, live in, in similar circumstances. There is this uh, very funny book, I mean, dark and funny at the same time, by uh, Theodore Dalrymple uh, called Life at the Bottom, where he's a, he's, a, um, he's a psychiatrist, a British psychiatrist, recounts his experience uh, dealing with the... the British underclass, uh, and it's really it's really funny and dark at the same time. But like, uh, but it's really striking. Some of the similarities are really striking. So we we see those same, um, we see those similarities reflected in, uh, for example, J. D. Vance's uh, memoir, uh, Hill, Hillbilly Elegy, where he tells a story that is very familiar to me from my own upbringing uh, years before in Chicago, but a very similar kind of thing. I have to say this, uh, Philippe. Um, my PhD dissertation, which was written 40 plus years ago, uh, has an essay called A Dynamic Theory of Racial Income Differences, in which I make the argument that uh, you have uh, discrimination in formal economic transactions, but you also have discrimination in informal social interactions, and that if you end the former but persist in the latter, because of neighborhood effects, now by neighborhood, I don't only mean geographic neighborhood, but I also mean relational neighborhood, who are your friends, peers, associates, yeah. and so on. Uh, the adverse uh, consequences of concentrated poverty via social interactions, which are not equalized when you have equal opportunity in formal economic transactions, would cause there to be an overhang so that poverty in the past would be reproduced into the present and uh, continue on into the future. And that that constituted a first order problem. This was in 1970s. So we're looking at uh, a very hopeful future coming out of the civil rights movement. And I said, don't be so optimistic. This problem could be with us for quite a long time. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling somewhat vindicated, un unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> by the way things have evolved. Uh, but, I, but I want to talk to you about that National Review article. Uh -huh. um, we have, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes here. Um, which uh, uh, throws down a marker. I mean, you, you're saying that all of this, uh, 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 you know, consternation and agitation and protest, uh, NFL players with their fists in the air and so forth, uh, um, all of the Black Lives Matter demonstration, the marching and so forth, the, 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 the mobilization of people, the anger, the rage, uh, is uh, built on a shaky foundation. Factually, uh, the claim is that African Americans are in, in danger of brutalization by police who are not held to account for what they do. Uh, you start your article with reference to that case in, um, in uh, St. Louis, uh, where the police officer is acquitted by a jury. But as you probably know, the uh, black residents of that city, uh, including ministers and political leaders, have been demanding a conviction uh, the trial was a bench trial. The verdict was rendered by a judge, not, not by a jury. The judge looked at the evidence and came to a conclusion. But there had been warnings that there would be civil disturbance, and there was civil disturbance in the aftermath of that verdict. So what I'm trying to say is people are very fired up now about something, and you're claiming that it's resting on an uh, empirically false foundation. And I, I'd just like to give our uh, listeners a chance to hear more from you about why you think that and what the facts are that you're calling attention to. Uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, to be clear, I want to be clear that I, I don't know the detail of this particular case. I don't want to comment on this particular case. I'm All not right. denying that there are, uh, you know, there is no doubt that there are uh, uh, cops that uh, uh, brutalized people, you know, black people, uh, not just black people, but perhaps in particular black people uh, uh, wrongly without justification, etc. And maybe this is one of these cases. I don't know. Uh but I, what I did is I looked at something called the uh, Police Public Contact Survey. Yeah. Which is, uh, it's, a, it's a very large survey that's done every uh, four or five years. It, has, it hasn't been done in a while. I don't know why. But uh, yeah. last time was in 2011. I looked at 2005, 2008 for reasons I'm not going to get into. But um, And so uh, this is a survey where they ask... Uh, uh, they take a very large uh, nationally representative sample of the population and they ask people, have you had any contact with the police during the past 12 months? And then if they say yes, they ask them a bunch of questions about the nature of their interaction with the police during the contact in question or during the last contact. Yeah. And in particular, they ask them if uh, uh, they experience the use of force from the police. And then if they have, they ask them all sorts of questions about the nature of the force used uh, have you been kicked? Have you been like verbally uh, uh, abused, or you know that sort of thing? And so I did that, and and you know when and so this is again, this is black people talking, you know, because you know, people you always hear, uh, we need to hear, you know, we need to listen to what black people are saying. So that's what I did. I looked at this very large uh, victimization survey, and what I found was that it was incredibly rare for. Uh, uh, for black, I looked at black men specifically because the narrative focuses on black men, uh, and I found that it was very rare for black men to be uh, the, to experience the use of force from the police. It's also quite rare for them to even have any interaction with the police because you have this narrative about how you can't be a black man without and go out without like being harassed by the police. But actually, according to this survey, uh, only 17.5% of uh, black men have any interaction uh, with the police in any given year. And and then I looked at those who had more than three interactions. So, you know, be, and there are only 1.5% of black men who have um, uh, more than three interaction during the past, you know, in any given year. That's compared to 1.2% for white men. So, you know, the, there are a little bit more black men who have uh, numerous interactions with the police in any given year than white men, but it's not the difference. It's hardly uh, ridiculous. And when you look at violence, it's the same thing. You know, I mean, here you have disparities that are larger. Uh, I'll come to this a bit later, maybe. But uh, putting aside for the moment the uh, the disparities, um, it's still the case that black men, are, you know, that that they're incredibly unlikely to be. Uh, to experience force from the police. So, you know, it's not true. It's just not true that uh, uh, black men uh, are constantly harassed and brutalized by the police. You know, it, it's just it's just not true. And th those are the best data we have, at least about, you know, the nation as a whole. I, I try to, um, uh, you know, look at it. It's still true even when you look at Black people have the most interactions with the police. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there aren't like places where uh, uh, black people are stopped like very frequently. Except I'm sure there are some, but the point is that when you look at the uh, black experience as a whole, um, it, it's really it's just not the case. So, no, you 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 mentioned the fact that. Um, Nevertheless, there was a lot of outrage about this and that a lot of people seem to believe the narrative, you know, like I, I don't question that all these people, whether they're black and white, you know, because there are also a lot of white people who perhaps even more uh, uh, who believe that narrative, that they sincerely believe it. And my explanation for this is simply that uh, because the media focuses on a few uh, incidents uh, that are very dramatic uh, it gives people uh, 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 the wrong impression. You know? they, they generalize and they conclude that these sort of things happen all the time when in fact it's incredibly rare. You know, there is this trope about unarmed black men being killed by the police, but I also did the math uh, 
and you're about as likely to be struck by by lightning if you're a black man than to be uh, killed while you're unarmed. And keep in mind that being unarmed doesn't mean that you're not dangerous. Uh, you can do, you know, sometimes people are unarmed, but they do, you know, they, they force the police to use their, uh, their firearms. So uh, my explanation is that the media uh, gives people a wrong impression. And so when I say that to, to my liberal friends, they're very reluctant to admit this. In fact, usually it makes them pretty angry when I say that. Uh, they think I'm like, uh, not taking seriously black people, etc. But, you know, again, that's what I did. I listened to, you know, the thing is that uh, if, if you ask black people uh, how common do you think police brutality is, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get a lot of them that tell you that it's very common. Okay. But then if you ask them, were you a victim of police brutality? That's what the, the, the PPCS, the survey I was talking about, did. And you use that to calculate prevalence rate. You, feel, you find that it's very low. So there is this disconnect between, so black people think it's very common, but just think it happens to other people. Um, and and no, what I, when my liberal friends are angry when I tell them that, what I, say, when I tell them, what I tell them is, look, why are you surprised by this? You yourself spend your time. There is a cottage industry of articles talking about the way in which people in general and white people in particular overestimates uh, the prevalence of crime and think that it has drastically increased in the past 15 years, even though it actually it has been the, the largest uh, drop in crime rates in, yeah. in, in, in recorded history. And they're right about this. So, but what this shows is that, uh, but you know, similarly with crime, you know, there's been a lot of media attention to some very gruesome incidents. And so it gives people the impression that uh, crime has increased when in fact it has diminished. Okay. No, liberals have no problem admitting that when it comes to crime. You know, they, they are the ones who write these articles I'm talking about. We'll say pointing out that even though crimes rate, crime rates have fallen dramatically in the past 20 years, uh, people think that crime, have, uh, crime has increased. But for some reason, when it comes to black people, they seem to think that they're somehow immune to this phenomenon. But they're not. Why would they be? Yeah. Like I said in my blog post, they don't have a ma magical <laughs> radar in their head, you know. I, I, I want to remind you that uh, when Barack Obama was president, he said, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. He said, the black community is not crazy to imagine that these are problems out there, after all, in my own experience. Okay? Even at the funeral, when he spoke at the memorial service for the police officers who'd been assassinated in Dallas, he, uh, Barack Obama, and I'm not criticizing him, I'm simply reporting to you what this very sophisticated and intelligent person, I think we can all agree that he's not a, a rube, a boob, a fool. Yeah. He, he, he's a sophisticated and thoughtful man. He's an African-American, he's president of the United States, and in his conduct of uh, the responsibilities of that office, he too, in a way, fueled this false narrative that you're talking about. And I point that out only to underscore how seductive the narrative is. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, an interesting problem for those of us who are uh, you know, seriously interested in trying to think about how people come to construct what they think they know about the world and how they can uh, often get it wrong. Why is this narrative so compelling uh, to the minds of sophisticated and well-informed uh, individuals, uh, blacks and whites? So. Yeah, you, you know, I was talking with a friend about uh, uh, virtue signal. I'm not saying that's all Obama was saying, because I suspect is much more calculating than that, but uh, uh, at least about, about this. Um, and, and, you know, there is something interesting that, you know, often you tend to assume that when people veer to signal, they don't believe what they say. And, you know, I think that's wrong. Uh, I think that one interesting thing about virtue signaling is that quite often it produces genuine belief. So in general, you know, I think that when you have a material interest in believing something or, you know. Uh, I see. And, and, be it, you know, because it, it gives you rewards of one sort of another, you know, virtue signaling, it can be, uh, you have symbolic rewards, you know, because you're one of the good guys and, you know, 
uh, people appreciate you for this. Whereas when I say the kind of stuff I do, well, you know, it depends on the people, but let's just say that not everybody appreciates it. Uh, uh, but, you know, you, you get rewards from it. I think, that, you know, psychologically, it's a very unstable position when you say something constantly that you don't really believe. So I think a very common phenomenon is that when people start virtue signaling, and at first perhaps they're not quite convinced that, you know, they kind of know that what they're exaggerating, what they're saying is, is not true. But eventually I think it it, it, it it ends up producing genuine belief because otherwise it's a very unstable psychological situation. No, and that's... so... No, that's very, very interesting. I mean, you're talking about confirmation bias. I think that's what the psychologists call it. A tendency for us to want the belief that we have to be confirmed by the senses. And so we will sometimes distort our perceptions in order to make them conform with what it is that we come believing. But combining that with the virtue signaling. So I'm saying something because I want to be thought of as being on the right side of history I'm saying it, and I might not entirely believe it, or I might have my doubts, but if I say it often enough uh, in order to maintain my own psychological uh, uh, well-being, I will uh, begin to come to start putting those doubts uh, away and, and affirming this thing as being obviously true. When I began thinking that, it, I'm not so sure it's true, but I do know it's the right thing to say. <laughs> so Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, I think, I mean, I think to... to to some degree, everyone has experienced that, you know. Uh, we've all experienced wanting something to be true so much that uh, we start looking at the evidence and, and we kind of know that we're, like, uh, not looking as uh, as critically as the the contrary evidence to, to you know, contrary to our f favorite view as to the, the evidence that actually supports it and, and you know, and and I think that if you have a little bit of like uh, self awareness, you can you can see that yourself in, in your own experience, you you felt that uh, urge sometimes to uh, not to look not to uh, not to look as critically to some of your belief as you should have, and then you know you, you if you look back on your like the history of your, uh, uh, the evolution of your beliefs, you know, I know it's my case at least, uh, you can see that uh, at one point in your life you've come to believe something, even though at the beginning you, you didn't really have the, you, you kind of knew it was a bit fishy, you know, uh, but, but after a while, you know, you, you keep repeating it and, you, you know, and, and, and you become invested in it. And it becomes very hard once you're at you reach that point. It becomes very hard to uh, to get rid of the belief, you know. So I I think that when people talk about vir and you know and virtue signaling adds to this, you know, and, and well, it's one of the factors that's gonna that can get you there. But I think the point I want to make is that I think too often when people talk about virtue signaling, they assume that the people who virtue signal don't really believe what they say. And and I think well maybe at the beginning, but but often quickly they they end up really believing it, you know. And of course, that makes it all the more difficult to, to convince them otherwise. Let, let me ask you one final thing as I'm running out of time here. Um, and uh, in a blog post of yours that I read recently, you make a point about uh, the epistemic climate for conservatives and liberals on campus. And you, you argue that, in fact, it's a much healthier climate for conservatives, ep epistemically speaking, yeah, than for yeah, liberals. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd like you to explain what you mean by that and, and why, you, why you hold that view. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, as you know, uh, you know, if you're in academia, it's like arc dominated by, by liberals. You know, if you're a, a conservative, you, 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 feel, uh, you feel pretty alone at times. Uh, but, but, and, of course, this comes with all sorts of uh, disadvantages for conservatives. You know, they're, they're routinely vilified, et cetera, et cetera. But the point I make is that it also comes with one benefit, uh, which is, as you say, epistemic in nature, which is that um, as a conservative in academia, you're surrounded by liberals. So you know their arguments about, you, you know, about any question. You know exactly what they're going to say because you've heard it before, okay? But if you're a liberal in academia, Often you haven't heard, you haven't heard the, the the arguments of the other side, and the problem is that as as uh, John Stuart Mill famously explained, and many 
other people explain, uh, you know, your beliefs are, aren't really secure until you've also heard the argument for the opposite belief from the opposite side. And so that I think that th this, um, the way in which conservatives are treated on uh, campuses is not just bad because it's it's wrong to vilify people, you know, for having certain views when those views are perfectly reasonable. You know, maybe they may be false, but you know, reasonable. Those are things reasonable people can disagree about. Uh, so this is it's not only wrong because of that because it's wrong to treat people that way for that kind of reasons. It's also wrong because. Uh, it makes people stupid, you know, because it means that on a lot of topics, such as the one of police violence, you know, and racial bias in the criminal justice system, uh, your, you, their beliefs are on very shaky foundations because they haven't heard the arguments from the other side. And, and so in, in that way, conservatives are at an advantage here because they have heard, you know, by the... the you know, it's not that maybe they don't want to, but they don't have a choice. You know, they're surrounded by liberals, so they hear this, their arguments all the time. It's not the case for uh, for liberals. So, uh, you know, it's just like a way of making the case that um, we should be, you know, like uh, liberals, you know, it, liberals will continue to dominate academia, but I think it, it would be in their own advantage, you know, in, you know to... Uh, to make it so that conservatives in academia feel more free to to speak, you know, to, to say what, because, you know, very often uh, liberals on this point or that point think that uh, they obviously are right because, uh, you know, they've never heard uh, an argument for the, uh, to, to show that they were wrong. But of course, very often if they haven't heard it, it's not because the argument doesn't exist. It's just because people are scared. I mean, you have no idea how many, I'm like, I mean, I'm openly right wing, you know, so I don't try to. And uh, but you know, there are very few people who are openly right wing in academia. And but it's not because there are no, you know, sure there are a minority, but there are right wing people in academia. They just like hide, you know. I mean, it's absurd. Like um, you have no idea how many times I hear people. Here's the worst part: it's not just right wing people. Yeah. Uh, very often, I, I hear from uh, uh, liberal people, very liberal people. We just don't feel comfortable uh, saying certain things, you know, because there's this hysteria going on and you can't, uh, you know, I think that uh, some of this uh, uh, racial agitation on campuses, that's a good example of this, actually. I know a lot of people uh, who are liberal and, and, you know, often they're not white, too. That's another interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, they think a lot of this stuff is nonsense. You know, when you have people, I read this article recently about what's going on at Reed College. And in, in spite online, it's an online magazine. And uh, I'll send you this article. It's completely surreal. I mean, it's insane. And, um, and you know, a lot of people, I, in fact, I've known that, that the majority of people, uh, at least among faculty, you know, and uh, uh, grad students is starting to change. I don't know, but like uh, at least professors, you know, I think a majority of them think that this is nonsense. It's not that they're not sympathetic to the causes, etc. But, but uh, some of the ways in which it's expressed, you know, they just think this is bonkers, you know. Uh, but they will never say it, you know, because they're so scared. And, yeah. and so that's the worst part of this thing is that it's not just. It's bad enough if it's conservatives that 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 don't feel free to speak to say what they really think. But it's gotten to the point where even liberals don't think, they you know don't feel free to, to say what what they want. So that's I, I think it's insane, you know, and uh, uh, that that's why I think like the uh, heterodox academy and this sort of movement, I think it's a really good idea and that it, it should be encouraged. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved with them as well. There is something I'm going to want to talk to you about again if you're if you're willing to give me another hour, uh, maybe sure. after a couple Great. of months, and that's immigration restrictionism. Uh, oh, yeah. which, which I know you advocate uh, uh, and which I've been thinking hard about in the context of the position of low-skilled African-American workers here in the United States and worried that, and, and I, I, I know about the self-censorship because I'm engaging in it to a certain degree, 
I'm an economist. I think labor markets are competitive. I think wages are bid down by an increase in supply. I know that many of the people whom I'm most concerned about are competing in that very situation. And yet the public advocacy of African-American interest will stay away from that uh, like, you know, it's the plague. And I worry about that. So I confess. That's my confession. But I'd like to come back to you after a month, a couple of months, yeah, maybe. That would be clear. I would love it. I, and I'm, yeah, that's another of my uh, obsession. In fact, that's a much bigger obsession for me than, uh, than what right. we talked about this time. So I'd love to talk about this. We have something to look forward to. Thank you very much, uh, Felipe. Great. Thanks okay. to you. Thanks a lot for having me. It was great. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop the uh, recording.